Welcome everyone to our next lecture on machine learning. So today we talk about linear regression. There was a question in the Ilias about German words for many of the things that we say here. Um, maybe one that I missed was that estimator is the same as Schätzer, okay, for example, that one. Or there's, I, we didn't talk about unbiased estimators, but that's translated into Erwartungstreue Schätzer. That's also one which is far away from the wording. However, most of the notions I'm telling you here about these Bayesian statistics and this kind of stuff, I think I don't know very much German references where it's, I don't know many German references where, where you could look it up. So better look it up in the English one. So the one that I would recommend is a, is a book from Kevin Murphy on machine learning. So that is the one I would recommend for this kind of stuff. He has very nice chapters on distributions. And when I look at the chapters, it looks like probably the person where I copied my slide from, the person copied the slide from someone else, and that person was maybe Kevin Murphy, OK? So many of the, of the great examples are from Kevin Murphy. But then typically, these things, they emerge. And you, when you give a lecture, you see, oh, I need more explanation here and there. And you edit and edit, and it's kind of developing and diverging. But the Kevin Murphy one is a nice presentation. Sometimes, also, details are glossed over. Or at least, I'm not clever enough to understand them right away. But nonetheless, it gives you a different perspective on things. So I would suggest the Kevin Murphy one. Good. Um, last time, um, we had talked about estimation. So this was a summary of point estimators. So basically, starting from our Bayesian point of view, base rule with prior posterior likelihood, evidence, all these things, somehow we were able to talk about maximum likelihood estimation, which is basically just maximizing the likelihood. So that is a frequentist, a classical estimator, um, very well known, very good. And we can understand it also having our Bayesian head on, right? It's just maximizing the likelihood and ignoring the rest. So ignoring the prior, ignoring the posterior. However, then there are the interesting base estimators, which is an interesting framework. So starting basically with certain loss function in Bayesian decision theory, we could come up with different point estimates here. One is, for example, the map estimator, which is maximizing the posterior distribution, OK? And it corresponds to calculating a certain integration for the 0, 1 loss. And then you get the map estimator. And there's another one when you minimize some quadratic loss function, you get the posterior mean, okay, which is an average. And then there's also the posterior median, which is kind of looking for the point such that 50% of the mass is smaller and 50% of the mass is larger. Okay? So those two here, they both look at the full density. Okay? So they require knowledge over the full density to be calculated. The maxima posteriori does not. Yeah? So there, the maximum could stay the same, even if some other stuff is changing somewhere. Okay? Um, of course, in a way, it also needs to look at all data points since it wants to be the maximum. Okay? However, it's basically not so much influenced by what's happening outside, whereas the others are influenced. Right? The mean is shift is moving, sl move, moving slightly. If the variance to one side could be very large, then the mean would kind of take account of that one. Okay? So those are all point estimators. Now, in the context of Bayesian inference, we would say, we are happy when we have the posterior, and that's basically the summary of our inference problem. And then we can go on, for example, with a point estimate. But we don't have to do it. We can also do more fancy stuff like um, the example that I showed you here that you did in the um, exercises with these sellers at Amazon, right? where you basically calculating here now a complicated, you're answering a complicated question here. So you're not doing hypothesis testing here, it's something Theta 1 is larger than theta 2 um, with p-value 0.005 or something. You are concretely calculating probabilities here, which is great because it's much easier to understand. However, it comes at a price. OK, so the criticism here would be, OK, if you can really write down your prior distributions very well with these beta distributions, then you can do Bayesian inference, and then you can also answer this question. However, that's what people often want, right? I mean, if you have a company or something, you want to make a decision now, which is better, this 
this seller or the other seller, and so you want to get a concrete number here, so which is nice. And if you know more about p-values and uh, classical statistical testing, you know that it's always a bit cumbersome, right? So this p-value, what does it exactly say? What probability is it? So that's not so easy, and it would be would fill another lecture to really understand it. So this Bayesian stuff is simply very intuitive, however, requires additional assumptions. The classical statistics is super duper rigorous. Everything is proven. However, it might answer a different question from the one that you want. Okay? So sometimes maybe the p-value is not what you want. Okay, so far so good. The general recipe of probabilistic inference or in a way it's Bayesian inference, but um, yeah, let's, uh, let me call it probabilistic inference since it's a generalization of my logical inference. So we have a story of something where we have unknowns and knowns and we have some stuff that we want to find out. And typically we have to specify a prior and a likelihood. This is defining our model. And then we turn the Bayesian crank and we get the posterior if we are lucky, okay? And from the posterior now we can do many different things possibly also just doing maximum likelihood estimation and ignoring the posterior, but in principle this is a, a, a good setup to do some inference. So now why does not everyone do it? So sometimes we also want to do maximum likelihood because we don't want to specify a prior, okay? Or maybe the posterior is a super complicated integration which we cannot do, which we need to sample or where we need to use some approximation methods which we do not trust. So there are also good reasons sometimes not to use it. But in principle, if we could do all these integrations, then that would be the way to go. Okay, good. Then there was a chapter on why map, the map estimation, is sometimes dangerous. Okay, and the story, um, let me tell you first the story before we go through this work. So depending on the parameterization of your random variable, you might get different outcomes. So that means when you parameterize uh, whatever the mean, Directly you get a certain estimate for the map, okay, and then it would be nice if I would have a reparameterization of this mean, for example to the power of 2 or to the power of 3, that my estimate would be also just the old estimate to the power of 3 or to the power of 2. That's not the case, unfortunately. So the map is not invariant with respect to the representation, okay? So does it mean it's all bad? No, it's not all bad, but just you need to be careful and aware of these kind of things. So how could we show something like this? There will be a hole in the derivation, which I also couldn't fill when I looked at it. But I will tell you nonetheless, and you learn a couple of things along the way. So first of all, let me talk about transformation of variables. That's, I think, a topic we haven't talked about. And it's like a very natural topic for us computer scientists. So suppose you have already some random variable x here given, and which means you also have the PDF of it, okay? Now suppose you programmed a computer program which is calculating y of x. So it's transforming the input, or it's transforming my random variable into something else. Then a natural question would be, so what is now the density of my transformed variable? Okay, so that is what we want to as, uh, answer here. And here I give a very simple instance of this theorem. So I'm assuming that the function y of x is a monotonic function that is invertible. Okay, so that's a simple case. And everything is scalar. So being invertible, it means that its inverse x of y also exists. And maybe by now you start being confused by this weird notation. What, what does it mean now? So basically I could have said f of x being the function, right? But I want to be like a bit economic with my letters that I'm using. Since my goal at the end is to define a random variable capital Y, why not call the transformation little y? Okay? That's kind of perfectly makes sense. So if I plug in a number into y of something, I get another number. Okay? So that is just a value. So a small letter kind of makes sense. Similarly, I could also talk about x of y, which is the inverse function, right? Plugging in a y, I get an x back, such that it's kind of compatible. You know there's this little story um, when, you, when you do your abitur or something similar, and there's a, the x, there, there are these questions where you do, need to do Coven discussion, right? Something like this, plus 2x. And now if your teacher is really nasty, yeah, there might be an extra question, which says, now do a proven discussion on that one, okay? And it might be exactly the same function. 
But many people will fail on that one, right? Because it never appeared before that your variable is called f and the function is called x. But it's just a renaming, right? I mean, if you have friends who are just in school and doing curve discussion, give them this example and see what they, what they make out of this, whether they are able to, to deal with it. Because we are so used to this f of x. So don't be too used to this notation. Sometimes it's very useful to use other letters, y of x and x of y. And once you're fine with that, you see why it's so easy and why it makes things more easy. So then we can say, plugging in a random variable into my function little y, I define a new random variable, OK? And now I can ask the question, so what is the PDF? What should it be? Of course, when you think about it, the distribution of x is some PDF, is some function. So in, in principle, kind of this monotonic function y of x is taking the x-axis and kind of transforming it, right? You could think about it like a rubber band, and you can stretch it. Or you stretch it only in part of it, and in other parts you kind of push it together or something. And then how is the density changing? I mean, visually, it's kind of clear, right? If you move around the x-axis, you put some squash some stuff together, then the density gets larger. You take some stuff wider, the density should go down a little bit. So it kind of makes sense that it, this should be defined. And now how exactly is it defined? So the PDF of y, where we now put a little letter y at the bottom too, to be sure what function we are talking about, it is basically the density of x where we plug in x of y. So this little value y for which we want to have the density value gets plugged into the inverse function. And then we are again in the domain of our random variable x. And we can plug it into the density of x. So this is the point where you really want to use these sub-indices. Otherwise, it gets confusing. However, that's not it. You need to rescale kind of what's going on. And you rescale it with the derivative of the inverse function. OK, so this is just the derivative of the inverse function. And you might see in this formula already where, where here are some vertical bars, so where there's the absolute value. And that's the more general form. I'm assuming here a monotonic increasing function. Oh, I should also write increasing function in this case. Oh, yeah, here up here I'm saying it. So it's an increasing monotonic function. And increasing means that the derivative is always positive. If it would have been a decreasing monotonic function, then basically the absolute value of this would have kind of changed the sign of the derivative, because it's only about the magnitude, about the absolute value of the derivative. So why the derivative is the right thing? Consider a random variable x, and you scale it with a factor of 2. OK, so let me show you on the board what's happening if you do that. So suppose um, this is the x-axis, like always. And now this is the density function of it. OK, so this is p sub x of x. And then I'm doing my magic transformation, in this case, y of x. OK, and let's take it's just 2 times x, OK? So it's just stretching the x-axis. So what does visually happen? I mean, it just happens that the whole thing kind of gets wider. But the shape is the same, OK? On the other hand, if this has a certain value, then this should have only half the value, right? Because now kind of the integration over the whole thing should still be 1. But kind of you stretch the x-axis, you doubled everything. That means you need to half the height of everything, OK? So what is the inverse function of that one? So x of y is just a half y, OK? And the derivative of that one is 1 half, OK? So that is the factor you need to multiply here. That's it. Now we can get more fancy. So suppose we are um, kind of stretching that part, and we are squashing this one, OK? It basically means now that here we have it more concentrated, right? This is getting more concentrated, and it needs to increase. And the same will happen. So on this side, we would have times 2. And on this one, we would have times a half. Again, the inverse will give us a half on this side. And the inverse of that one will give us a factor of 2 on the other side. And now you can go on and on and on and make it more complicated, more complicated. Basically, you need to multiply it with the local derivative, OK? So in higher dimensions, the derivative, the Jacobian, tells you something about the volume change. 
And here it tells you something if you have like a line segment, let's call it dx, okay, then how is it transformed to a dy, okay? So how does the volume change or how does the length change? That's why the transformation formula is like it is, okay? You need to kind of retransform it with the first derivative, okay? By the way, it has something to do with integration by substitution, right? When you have an integral and you substitute another variable in there, you are multiplying typically the function you are integrating over with some derivative. I can never memorize which one it exactly is, but it's exactly the same as this one. So this transformation rule is just some variation of integration by substitution, okay? So here's the informal proof of it. We want to preserve probabilities, right? So if there was a certain weight or some certain area in my density in some interval, also after the transformation it should be the same. So what is the, the probability mass in some certain interval? It's like some delta x, so that's like a, a small interval on my x-axis, times the height of my density, that's the area, and after the transformation with my new density p of y, I multiply it with the transformed interval, and that volume should stay the same. So probability is, in this case, area or volume, and it should stay constant. So this is basically what this transformation rule guarantees. Let's look at it again. So this dy, if I bring it to the other side, I have exactly this equation. So that's the way to memorize the formula as well. So you just memorize that p of x times dx, this thing should be equal to p of y times dy. Um, I think this notation is from Leibniz, and there's the Leibniz way of writing integrals, and it's super useful. Yeah? So for the logicists among you, this is non-standard analysis. The dx is a number that is smaller than all real numbers, but it's greater than zero. Okay, and there are number systems where these things exist, and then you can just have these elements, dx. So they are very small pieces. If you don't like non-standard analysis, you can just think of it as some little epsilon greater than zero, okay? And you can approximately, this is then true, right? Good, so far so good. Um, as I said, usually the absolute values. I just put it on the slide for you, okay? Good, so this is the transformation rule. So here comes an example. It's so short, it even fits on the board, uh, even fits in these very small lines. Maybe I should have put more space on it, but let's go through it. So given a random variable x with a PDF, p sub x, and given some transformation, yeah? So the little y of little x is logarithm of little x. And now suppose I plug in an x, I have a new random variable. What about my density? First of all, note the logarithm is an increasing monotonic function, so my theorem here applies, and I need to calculate certain derivatives. So what do I need? I need the derivative of the inverse. The inverse function of the logarithm is the e function, the exponential function, and the derivative of that one is the exponential function itself. So I need to plug in into the x density the e to the y, and I need to multiply it with e to the y. Okay, so that's it. Good, so far so good. Um, there's, this is the informal, the informal formula to remember. Okay, nice wording. Basically, when you memorize that one, and this is not wrong, the dx is just a little line segment, okay, and this is about two areas should stay the same, then you can always derive back the correct formula. So this is a weird way of memorizing it. Even also with the absolute values, it's weird, kind of. Where do they come from and why? So the easier way is to memorize it like this, okay? And then it's really simple. And basically, it's a variation um, of the integration by substitution. Or let's phrase it differently. We, we, we can kind of freely choose the p of y. How do we choose it? We choose it in such a way that your stuff that you learned about integration by substitution still works. Okay, so the integration by substitution should work. Okay, and the integration by substitution can be also very nicely written, written with these Leibniz dy's. So you can just multiply, you plug in here something, some formula for the y, some y of x, and then you multiply the dy with dx divided by dx. Or maybe I write it down because it's really simple. Um, 
So suppose the integration by substitution rule, um, and you're having an integration like, uh, what was it? Um, I want to have something like p of x dx. And now I'm saying I'm having, I can view x as a function of y. So let's plug it in here, OK? So this is the integration of p of x of y. Nice. But I also want to have um, the dy here. How do I get the dy? I just multiply with dy divided by dy, OK? Why not? It's not 0. It's small, but it's not 0. OK, and then if I move this around a bit, basically I could also say it's a dx divided by dy times the dy. And that is the integration by substitution rule, OK? And it's the same thing as the transformation of variable. So the transformation of variable is nothing new, complicated. It's just the integration by substitution rule in the context of probability theory, OK? Great. There are some subtleties. There's the so-called rule of the unconscious statistician. So there's some statement that the expectation of y can be calculated as the expectation of little y of x. So here some stuff is missing. So this is the expectation of y with respect to the density of y. OK, so this is just a definition over here. And this was just our weird definition of defining the expectation of a function. OK, so that's it. And the, the work happens in between here, right? So that's basically where something magic happens. So that's basically the integration by substitution rule that this holds. OK? Good. Um, this is also in Larry Wassermann's book, All of Statistics, really nice book. He calls this rule lazy, right? Why is it lazy? Because to calculate the expectation of y, you don't have to find p of y. You can write it in terms of p of x. So that's why it's lazy rule. It also has this nice name of the unconscious statistician. So the unconscious thing here is also applying to this lecture, right? I just defined this equation that the expectation of a more complicated function is this integral. However, it's only valid, this definition, because of this theorem. So this might be confusing or not interesting, interesting to everyone, but let me tell you nonetheless. So let's flip back to lecture uh, section 5, where we define the expectation of a random variable. So here we define for a random variable the expression ex, OK? And that is basically this average over all the values. Great. So this operator turns a random variable into a single number. Then we define the expectation of a function of x. And that is a bit strange. Why? Actually, f of x here that we plug in, we can also understand as a new variable, random variable, y. And that is already defined, right? I mean, the expectation of y has been defined on the previous slide. OK? It is exactly the one where I plug in a y here and a p of y over there. So this definition here is more like an extension of our notation. So we are allowed to plug in any expression under the expectation, not only random variables, but any of those. And the correct way to calculate is this integration here. However, this e equality here follows from the theorem of the lazy statistician. And so we were unconscious that this is not really a definition, but it's just extending our notation a little bit. And it's the one that makes sense. So I wrote it all down here. I extended the slides a bit to, to make sure that you get this. So we are unconscious about the theorem versus definition distinction in the previous definition, OK? However, the theorem of the unconscious definition, uh, statistician tells us that everything is fine. Don't worry, it's all right the way we did it, OK? Because this thing really holds because of integration by substitution, OK? So for everyone who's, who's wondering now, what is he talking about? This is just about what is the exact definition of the expectation. If you don't mind, just use that one, yeah? You can calculate the expectation of a function just by plugging into the, the function into the usual way to calculate things. However, the reason why it works is this theorem here. So that's why the definition of the expectation of a function makes sense. So there must be some compatibility between the random variables here fulfilled. 
Okay? So for me as a computer scientist, I don't care so much about this theorem. I'm just saying, okay, I can plug in any expression here, which is great if I want to program a computer algebra system or something else, okay? And I'm knowing everything will be fine because of the theorem. So if you didn't understand it, only thing you need to remember is everything is fine and you will be all right, okay? So don't worry about it. Just use it intuitively. It will be the correct thing. Good. So far, so good. So that is now just related very much to the um, transformation of variables rule, and it shows us kind of the close link between the integration by substitution and this theorem here. So now why is map dangerous? So here comes an example, and there's a missing hole in the derivation, and I, I will point to it, and if one of you can fill it, even better, okay? So please send me an email. I will include it into the slides immediately when I get the solution for the following question. So here comes the example. Again, what do I want to show you? I show you a random variable. So here it is. It's a beta distributed random variable and it has the letter pi. Pi has a disadvantage that there's no capital pi for the random variable. So I use the letter for the value and for the random variable, okay? I hope you don't mind. So pi is just a scalar between zero and one and it's distributed according to a beta distribution. Great, so far so good. Let's change the parameterization by non-linearly transforming the pi. Okay, so somehow now we are transforming the pi axis with some stretching, like a rubber band type of thing, and then the density will change, and then we will show that the map estimate for both these densities will be different. However, the mean will stay the same. So this is my transformation. Logarithm of pi divided by 1 minus pi. Okay, that is my transformation to calculate some other random variable, which I call x. The inverse of this logarithm is this function pi of x, 1 divided by 1 plus e to the minus x. That's a sigmoid function from neural networks. Okay, let me plot it for you, how it looks like. So it is just a function that... Um, Ah, oh, that's the wrong one, so it's this one. So it's mapping the interval from minus infinity to plus infinity to the interval between 0 and 1. That's what this function is doing. And so the inverse, the function x of pi, yeah, so that is the inverse of the other one. And the other one, the logarithm of pi divided by 1 minus pi, that is mapping the interval from 0 to 1 to minus infinity to plus infinity, and it's monotonically increasing. Now, what is p of x? Okay, we can now use our formula here. Just plug in for the x now the pi of x into the uh, density of my pi and multiply with the derivative. So the derivative, surprisingly, of the sigmoid function can be written as pi of x times 1 minus pi of x. That's just because there are so many e functions in there, so there's something funny happening. So it can be calculated very simply. So this, is, this can be derived very easily. The good thing is if you plug it in here, you, you see that it's just increasing the exponents by one, okay? So this is easy to calculate. Okay, so far so good. Now we could calculate the mean with and without the transformation, okay? Ah, I think this is wrong. I'm not sure. I have to think about it. So now we're getting closer to the, to the hole here. So the expectation of the beta distribution is just a divided by a plus b. So far, so good. The expectation of the x yeah, can be calculated by having this. Oh, this is the rule. Oh, now it's OK. For this equation here, I'm using the rule of the lazy statistician. Yeah, It's this one. And then when you do some magic calculation, which I don't include, and I haven't checked, and I haven't done, you will find out that it's a logarithm of a divided by b. OK? I should check it again, maybe. And surprisingly, that is exactly the same as mapping the expectation with my nonlinear transformation x of this one. So it's kind of a compatibility. No matter whether I parameterize my parameter between 0 and 1, I can calculate a certain mean. And if I map this mean into my new coordinate system of x, that is exactly the mean of the distribution that I'm getting. Okay? And this step here is a bit surprising to my eyes because it's like dragging out a nonlinear function out of the integration here, right? Which is kind of weird. And it's also 
wrong, okay? Because it's there's Jensen's inequality, and in Jensen's inequality tells you you can do it, but you will get an inequality, okay? In general, you can only do it for linear functions. However, here's more happening. So we are also changing the densities here, so it's more subtle and it's more complicated. But this is a place which I couldn't show. So I couldn't prove in general that if I have a transformation, then this expectation is equal to the x of the expectation. If you find a proof, let me know. I will include it into the slides. In this example, if you do the calculation, it works. And that's already surprising, since I'm really using a nonlinear function here. Good. What I'm saying here is, when I transform my random variable into a different parameterization, the means are compatible with each other. However, the maps are not. So map, in this case, is just the maximum of a given PDF. So it's not the a posteriori here, but let's assume this is the result of some computation and are reparameterizing. Then the maximum of that one can be calculated to be this a minus 1 divided by blah. And the maximum of my transformed random variable, of my nonlinearly transformed random variable, is something else. And it's ex in principle something else than the mapping of this point here. So when I reparameterize my random variable, the map estimate can change, which is very bad. Okay, this is something you need to be very careful with. So this is not a property that you want. So what is the missing hole here? I wanted to show you a proof that this is in general equal to Z1, and I were not able to do this. Okay, maybe some of you will be able to do that. Okay, I would be happy to read it. Good, so this is the why map is sometimes considered a dangerous example. So let's fill the hole. Actually, what I just said in the lecture is slightly wrong. So here is a corrected slide where everything should be true. So what is now different? So one cannot show that the expectation of x is equal to x of the expectation of pi. So where's the mistake? So basically, the right-hand side is a logarithm of a divided by b, but that is not the same as the expectation of x. The expectation of x can be computed using the digamma function, which I show you on the next slide how to do it. So, the conclusion that I've drawn earlier in the lecture now, that the mean will not change with the transformation, is wrong. Okay, So this is actually an example where the mean will change after transforming the distribution, and also the mode will change after transforming the distribution. Okay, so both are changing. So basically, there's even a bigger danger. You should be careful with these kind of point estimates. However, I think the median should be fine. So maybe I'm wrong on that one as well. We will see in the future. Okay, so have a look at the updated slides. They should be now correct. If you find yet another mistake, please tell me and I put another correction on this one. So here's a slide for the digamma function. So uh, how can we calculate the mean of x? So basically, we could start down here where we talk about the expectation of the logarithm of pi. And that can be found on some stack overflow page. And this is difference of two digamma functions as written down here. By combining this with some roots for the logarithm, we get the formula of the expectation of x, which I've written down here and on the top it's as well. I hope this helps. Again, the digamma function is yet another weird function which is used to solve these difficult integration things. But um, don't worry, you don't have to memorize this kind of stuff. So let's go on with the rest of the lecture. So let's go on with linear regression then. Okay, And I think Linear regression is a short topic. I think we are able to finish it in time. Let's hope for the best. Good, so this is the overview of today's lecture. And again, I'm following here Kevin Murphy's textbook, Machine Learning and Probabilistic Perspective. So that's a really nice textbook. Sometimes when you go through the stuff, um, there are some little details which you like to see that are not there. And something is hidden in a, just in a sentence. That's how it is. But on the other hand, the perspective is like a very modern machine learning perspective on things. So the way he deals with probabilities and all these things. So there's a lot to learn from. So I first will explain you what is regression. Okay, Then I will explain to you what is linear regression. We will see how we can use maximum likelihood estimator for linear regression. Then I show you what is rich regression and what is Bayesian linear regression. Okay, Somehow we just have the machinery there 
Everything will be just some Gaussian distributions, some multivariate ones that you multiply with each other. And as you know, at the end, everything is Gaussian. And we kind of can read off from our collection of formulas from the previous lectures on the Gaussian distributions. We can read off the solutions to all of the questions we will get today. OK? So we are just having, again, these weird formulas with some covariance matrices that are inverted and summed and inverted again. So this will happen again. But this is just a natural way to describe these things. And finally, some alternatives to the usual things here. OK, so first of all, what is regression? So um, the best way to explain it is with an image, right? So regression is typically understood. Um, how can I erase this? Oh, yeah, here. So regression is often understood as fitting a line through a couple of points, OK? So suppose you are having two axes. <coughs> X and Y. And you measured something, OK? So you have a couple of data points. Then basically, you have inputs and outputs. OK, this is a computer science view. And we want to have a description how to transform the input into the output. Or we want to have a computer program which does it. Or we just want to have a linear function which is kind of fitting the data. Where fitting the data now means the line should nicely go through it. And the more precise definition here is we want to have that these vertical distances kind of are minimized. More precisely, the vertical distance squared minimized. So this is another example of the method of least squares. By now, this should already ring a bell. It means lots of Gaussian distributions must there be somewhere hidden. And there are Gaussian distributions hidden. So where is it here? Basically, when we are saying we are using a least square estimate like this, it's like saying, OK, we have this nice true function. However, our measurements y are noisy. And the noise is distributed according to a Gaussian distribution. Okay? If you would transform the world here and basically would have everything like in such a way that like my straight line is like a, a, ver a horizontal line, and you could draw the histogram of the error, and it will be a Gaussian distribution. Okay? So in this case, like I would maybe draw it like this. OK, so it's a Gaussian distribution here. Um, note that this is kind of, I, I draw them all vertical here. I did not do it like this, like measure the distances like that. That would be the case if I say, put a shashlik stick in here, OK, and put these rubber bands around the nails. So put nails at all your data points, and then you put rubber bands around it, and then you let it kind of get to the right location. That's different from what we're doing here. So we are considering the vertical distance here. So that's what we are kind of modeling. OK? So, yeah. Yeah. The first, the first one measures yeah. So it's a different method. Okay. Yeah. I forgot the name. I think that it's I think it's a different method. And this is but this is the one we are considering. So linear regression, right? So what is linear here, right? Any answers? Any ideas? So any guesses? Why is it called linear regression? Coefficient the coefficient are linear, that's actually the answer. Any other wrong question wrong answers? I mean you looked already at the slides, maybe. So it looks like I'm fitting a straight line. A straight line looks like a linear function. That's why people think about this as linear regression, right? So if uh, you're in an interview for Google or something, and they ask you, so tell me about linear regression, you can draw a straight line, right? And you explain everything. However, that's not the point of linear regression. Exactly, the coefficients, the parameters will be linear. My function could be also nonlinear. OK, let me show you. Here's another example of linear regression. So my data is coming from something like this. And I'm fitting a polynomial to it. OK? And again, I could say the noise, like the distance here to the 
to the true value is modeled as a Gaussian distribution, and then it will turn out in my parameters, the way I parameterize it on the following slides, we will find out it is linear in the parameters. That's why it's called linear regression. So I would say it, I think, 10 times in this lecture. Linear regression is linear because it's linear in the parameters. The functions you are fitting can be nonlinear. OK? Good, so far so good. Um, so again, now with, without graphics, so the setup is we are given data points, x, y pairs, where the x are sometimes also vectors, right? I'm typically drawing out it now here for scalars, but they could be vectors, right? So for example, if the x would be two-dimensional vector, it would be like a x1, x2, and then we would kind of fit some surface here to the space, like where the axis up is the y-axis. And in principle, you could do it even in higher dimensions, right? So for example, you could have a, a volume with x1, x2, x3, and kind of measuring the temperature at every value here, at every location. And then you could also have a linear function, right? You could view like going from blue to green to red or something like going through the space like that. And you could do it for arbitrary dimensions. However, typically it's, it's easier now to look at it like scalars, but we will see it's, there are different ways to write it down. So why are typically scalars? So that's the difference. Why is that OK? Because if we have vector valued y, we are doing it for every coordinate separately. OK? And then we would have something simpler for every coordinate. So now the goal of regression is to find a function f, or to find a computer program, that maps now new locations onto the values, and that minimizes this squared error. OK? Why is it useful? So, for example, you can use it to predict celestial orbits, okay? And that was the original motivation for inventing this whole method by 24-year-old Gauss, okay? So if you're older than 24, it's already bad luck, so you won't get as famous as Carl Friedrich Gauss anymore. So he did this with 24. If you are younger, hurry up, okay? So celestial orbits, um, what is it about? It's, so it's about some... I think some comet or some asteroid Ceres, and it was observed that there's a point like moving yeah, with the telescope, and they were tracking it every evening. Unfortunately, then it was going behind the sun, okay? And you didn't know where to point your telescope behind the sun uh, after it passed the sun, because that, for this you need to extrapolate these points that you measured, and you need to extrapolate them very far through the sun and Ceres is lost, okay? So you are, you are looking at it and you're trying to find out is it on a collision course with Earth or whatever, when will it come back, and all these different pra parameters, is it a new planet, what is it? We want to get the parameters, but you only have three observations and you want to get more, but you don't know where to point your telescope to, okay? Because these telescopes, um, you can look at a very small angle on the sky, yeah? But uh, you only see there something if you look through the telescope. So if you look with your eyes, you see nothing. But when you look through the telescope, you see it. So sometimes it's very hard to position the telescope as the right thing. So isn't that a boring topic? I mean, astronomy, at that time, 200 years ago, it was like this super hot topic, OK? You were on a party, and you were saying, so what are you working on? I'm working on deep learning. What's that? I never heard about that one. What are you working on? I'm working on Ceres. Everyone, wow, yeah, that's fantastic. So what's the latest news about astronomy? How can we use mathematics to do astronomy? So that was the hot topic. So if you want to be, become a big shot, you have to work in astronomy, OK? Solve those mathematical problems. That was what everyone was doing at that time, developing mathematical methods kind of to predict the course of celestial bodies, OK? So that was the amazing stuff. You could do other things. You could inter interpolate measurements with regression, too, OK? So here's the example. I sometimes also watch my own older lectures to be reminded of what I wanted to say for a particular slide. So at this location, the example was you are living somewhere between Cologne and Düsseldorf, and there are measurement stations in Cologne and Düsseldorf for the temperature, and you want to interpolate between those, OK? And this can be also done with regression somehow, OK? What else can you do? You can also smooth out your noisy measurements. As I shown you already, sometimes a measurement is noisy, and you want to get like the true function that created the data. And for example, in spectroscopy, some method in physics, you get a very noisy measurement of the different energies or the different power and the different 
colors. And so with uh, regression, you can smooth out kind of the noisy stuff. You can also interpolate, but you can also extrapolate. So extrapolation means predicting the future for time locations to come. For example, global warming, okay? So you have these curves, and then you can fit something onto it, and by this predict how the global warming will go on. And as you know, the warming curve is like going up and down in a cycle for every year, but nonetheless, like there's a trend going up. And um, you can try to fit different models to it and then trying to predict the future with it. So, more generally speaking, regression is the input are vectors, the output are real valued scalars. Okay, so that is regression. In contrast to classification, where the outputs are discrete values like class labels. Okay, so one is continuous output and the uh, classification would have been a discrete output. Okay, so far so good. So, that is the regression setup. Important problem, you need it everywhere, okay? So here's the procedure. So how do we do it? We write down first a model for our unknown function f. Let's write it down for a scalar. So we could have two parameters, w0 and w1, and this forms a linear function. And now by tweaking the w0 and the w1 in such a way that it fits my data very well, I could estimate these parameters. How well these parameters fit? by the method of least square. So what did Gauss do? He came up, he wanted to have the theoretical foundation. So why are we using least square? So for that, he needed to introduce a Gaussian distribution. And then you can derive it that least square is the right thing to do. So here's another example. This is a nonlinear function. It's, a, it's some parabola. And it, not ha it doesn't have two parameters, but it has three parameters. And now this is a nonlinear function in x. However, it is linear in the parameters that I want to learn. Okay, so this is just the inner product of this vector w0, w1, w2 times 1x and x squared. Okay, so um, as I said, so this is a function that is linear in the parameters. That's why the whole thing is also called linear regression when I'm having x squared. Okay, so here's another one. In general, I can have any polynomial in here. Okay, and still it's linear regression. And now the story is we fit these models with least squares. That means we are minimizing um, basically the least square criterion here. And now the question is why are we using least square? So everyone is doing it and looks like it's working very well, but why are we not using absolute values or some other stuff? So what are the assumptions? You know it already. We assume that there's a Gaussian distribution hidden, okay? But this will be made clear in the remainder of the lecture. So these are basically the two papers. So this is a paper from Karl Friedrich Gauss, where he's introducing this um, regression stuff, or basically where he's introducing the method of the normal distribution. So he wanted to get a solution for the Ceres problem with this asteroid or planetoid. And for this, he invented the normal distribution because he figured out if I'm applying maximum likelihood onto the normal distribution, then I will obtain the method of least squares. Okay, and by this giving it a solid foundation, why it works so well. Now, for you, this is all kindergarten stuff, right? You learned already in kindergarten that the normal distribution is like from the central limit theorem, the, the distribution that you will get if there are many effects that sum up each other, okay? So it plays a special role. If my telescope has lots of different errors, if the atmosphere is creating weird errors and some other stuff. So if I'm assuming that my errors are like some super complicated combination of a zillion different randomness sources, then the central limit theorem says that is very well approximated by the Gaussian distribution. Okay, so that's why the method of least square is so great. Yeah, so it's just combined with the central limit theory. That is the answer if you are ignorant about the details. Okay, so if you don't know exactly what's going on, use the method of least square. So that's typically a good approximation to the mistakes that are there in, the, in your data. Okay, and he worked it all out. And as you know, like 200 years ago, there was also big competition be between France and Germany in science, and so every thing that you see in some German paper, you will also see in some French paper. And they, of course, knew of each other, and they also pushed each other to be the greatest scientist or the greatest mathematician. Very interesting in the field of um, complex analysis, for example, with Weierstrass and um, his colleague. I forgot the name. 
Anyone knows? Yeah. I think Bolzano, or there's another one. There's another one, okay. Anyway, so there's like this competition thing also going on here. Let's look at the title. What is Le Genre up to? Is he also working on deep learning? No, he's also about the determination, the orbit des comets. He's also in astronomy, okay? Also this big mathematician is doing astronomy. So this is the hot stuff 200 years ago. So by the way, where do I know these weird stories? I'm, I'm reading this stuff and then I forgot half of it and you get like a new version of it from me. But if you want to see the original, look at the Wikipedia pages on the regression analysis history chapter. So that's where basically everything is explained more precisely than I do. Good, so far so good. Where are we? So we are at this question. Why using least squares? Now, in order to write everything succinctly down, we need a good notation. And when you look at regression papers or regression books, there are different variations. And I will also show you now different variations for notation, okay? And ideally, then when you see it somewhere written up in another book, you can um, think about it and match it to the stuff that you learned here. So this is a simple situation. We have a single data point observed, right? I mean, of course, we cannot really fit a line through a single data point, but it gives us some information. But let's just talk about notation. And we want to model our function as a linear function. So my location x, let's assume it is this a vector, then the function value at location x is modeled as x transpose w. So it's the inner product of my vector x with my weight vector, okay? And that is the linear function in x. It's also a linear function in w. If you want to have a constant offset like a w0, you could include a constant 1 in your vector x, okay? So that's also included here. Um, my measured value y is now Gaussian distributed around this x transpose w. Okay, so this is the inner product. This is taking the column vector w and it's multiplied from the left with the row vector of x. So everything is summed out and you get a scalar. Now this scalar is the mean of a univariate Gaussian distribution with some variance sigma squared. So the, my measurements y will be a little bit up and down the true line or the true function, okay? So that is the measurement noise, yeah? So that's the variance. Sigma is the measurement noise variance, okay? And here the value of y is a scalar. The unknown parameter is the w, okay? And the parameter sigma squared is typically assumed to be known, okay? That's just how the setup is. Okay, so far so good. So that is one way to write it down. Again, because the x transpose w is linear in w, that's why it's called linear regression. Let's look at multiple data points and a linear function. So in this case now we have a whole matrix of vectors. So we have vector x1 to xn. How do we put it cleverly in a matrix? Ideally we would put it as column vectors, right? So that would be the natural way. However, often in books and papers you see it the other way around. You see it as rows. So you have a chapter on machine learning and suddenly in the linear regression chapter everything flips and you are talking about row vectors. Don't be confused by that. We will see why this is useful. So it is useful because then we can model our function values just as x times w. So just as a matrix vector multiplication. So we want to multiply row times column, next row times the same column, next row times the same column. And those are exactly the same numbers that we computed on the previous slide for a single data point. But there we wrote x transpose w. If we put the vectors as rows, we can omit the w, okay? And I think that's the reason why it's very convenient. Also here you might say, ah, come on, a single transpose sign is not such a big deal. However, there will be more complicated formulas on the following slides, and then it gets a mess with the transpose sign. So let's use this standard notation here. Now, we have these measured, uh, we have the true values xw, which is now a vector of scalar values for y, okay? So each entry in this vector x times w is a correct function value, and the measurement is basically a multivariate Gaussian distribution around this mean vector xw, where now the sigma is typically often a diagonal matrix, okay, with sigma squared on the diagonal. So the entries are not correlated with each other, okay? So that's for simplicity often here the case. 
So the vector y contains for every x i a scalar value, the output. Okay? Again, x times w is linear in w, so this is called linear regression. Okay, so far so good. Let's get to nonlinear regression. Okay? So we want to fit nonlinear function. Oh no, I said it wrong myself. Let's get to linear regression for nonlinear functions. Okay, it's still linear regression, but for nonlinear functions. How can we do this? We could do this with basis function expansions. Okay, so what is that? So suppose we are now having a scalar x for simplicity. It's always the, the pattern here, right? You first talk about scalars, write everything down, and then you think about it, how do I have to write it down for vectors, okay? But then this step is typically not so difficult when you did the scalar one before. So suppose I'm having this interesting looking function, phi of x, which is mapping a scalar onto this vector. So the input is a scalar, the output are basically the powers of this scalar where the 1 is basically x to the 0, okay? And then we have x to the 1, x to the 2, and up to x to the d. And in this case now, I'm writing it as a column vector. Why? Because for um, the single data point, I think the it was a column vector, and I was using x transpose w, and I want to use the same thing here. If I now multiply it with a w here, I'm getting a polynomial, okay? So this is now a more complicated function, which gets more interesting. I can do the same also for vectors. And I write it out for you for a two-dimensional vector, where I'm already kind of confusing this. So now it's a row vector. I did it on purpose, kind of, because I want to have the phi of x to be a column vector. But whatever. So what are the polynomial basis functions in that case? So basically, I'm allowed to take both to the power of 0. Yeah, then I'm getting a 1. I can take the first one to the power of 1 and the second one to the power of 0, then I'm getting the x1, or the other way around, or one of them squared, or both of them getting an, an, an exponent of 1. I can make all these different poly, uh, expansions here. These things are also called monomials. Okay? Those are like, you have like a set of variables, x1 to xd or something, and you can make arbitrary product of these to the power of something. Of course, this, in this case, I need a clever notation also for the coefficients here, right? Because I would need w, y, i, j, kind of like depending on the exponents here. And I'm getting more complicated polynomials. So those are now polynomials where the inputs are vectors. However, it's not, we never do it explicitly. So the case we typically look at is that one. But in principle, we can also do it in higher dimensions. So in general, the phi, if I build it like this, it maps some vector x like onto, in, in a nonlinear fashion onto the more longer vector phi of x. Okay, why is it longer? For example, let's say your input space is, has two dimensions, so it has x1 and x2. And now if I'm calculating all of those coefficients, maybe this sheet of paper turns out in 3D to look like this. Okay, so along one dimension, I kind of bended it with my squared function. Along the other dimension, I did not. Okay, and it could be even higher dimensional. Still, it's a two-dimensional sheet of paper, but it's now bended in space. Of course, now here, I, the, the linearness of my linear regression leads to a nonlinear function fitted to my data. Okay, good. Um, and these entries of these vectors, they are sometimes also called features. And we will come back to this idea in kernel methods, where kernel methods are kind of having an even more general point of view for this kind of linear regression setup. Great, so far so good. Um, again, phi of x transposed times w is a linear function in w. So we are still linear regression, and we are still having linear reg regression, but we are nonlinear in x now. So if I have a single data point, x, yeah, which in, let's assume it's a scalar. It's easier to think about. Then phi of x is a vector times my parameter vector. Okay, so that is a nonlinear function in x. Again, it is the mean of a univariate Gaussian distribution for a single observation. And again, this is called linear regression. Fine. We can also do the same with multiple data points. Um, and now we would say phi of x is the matrix with all these rows. Okay, why are there now rows? Because this is giving me a simple way to write things up. I could then say that phi of x, which is kind of nonlinear transforming my row vectors in x 
in such a way that I have longer row vectors in each of the rows of my phi of x, and that gets multiplied with my w. And my noise process here is now a multivariate Gaussian distribution. So it looks complicated, but this phi of x has just new locations. So before you might have two dimensional locations, and after the mapping with phi, you might have five dimensional locations. That's it. Okay? So for that reason, now for the following rest of the lecture, I will never ever again talk about phi of x. You can always do it. You can always non linearize your data by mapping it with the phi. But at the end, it will be a matrix X where every data point is in each row is some location in some space. Okay? But it might be the result of applying phi. Good. So all results in the following will hold for X and also for phi of X. Okay? In all these things that I wrote down now, the goal is always to find the parameter vector W. Again, question. So why is linear regression called linear? And I have a couple of answers for you. Because it's linear in the features? Maybe. Because it's linear in the parameters? Yeah, in a way too. Uh, because it honors Francois Philippe Marquis de Linear? Maybe not. Because it sounds more scientific than just regression? Definitely yes. Yeah, klar, of course. Yeah. So, I mean, you know the true answer is it's linear in the parameters. That is the reason for it. Okay? So, and if you don't get anything and don't remember any of the formulas, you should at least know what linear regression is after the lecture. Okay? Good. So let's get to estimation. So let's do maximum likelihood estimation. Okay, so far so good. It's just the arc max of my likelihood. Okay? What is the D now? So now here I'm following the notation, I think, of the Kevin Murphy book. And it's a bit funny, as we will see in a second. But when you know it's funny, then again you see that it's fine and it's kind of clever and very succinct. So we have data, x1, y, uh, x1, y1, and so on and so forth. That is my D, and it's IID data, independently distributed, all uh, having the same, uh, independently identically distributed. Okay? So all coming from the same noise distribution here, which we specify, and they are independent for us Bayesians, given the parameter. Okay? So given the parameter, they are independent of each other. So that basically means that the likelihood will factorize into these pieces. And here you see why the notation is a bit weird. Because, I mean, this is our noise distribution, right? So there's a mean given here, or maybe something else, and the y depends on the location. However, on the right-hand side, the d is only on the left-hand side of the bar. So this notation is slightly wrong, yeah, but it's very common to write it that way. The locations are assumed to be known and fixed, and actually the only thing that kind of goes to the left-hand side are the y's. Yeah, but don't be confused by that. Okay? So more precisely, it would be if the d contains only the values y1 to yn, and we would write it like this, p of y given x comma theta. But it's very common to write it down like this. Okay? And don't be confused by it. Just be aware which part goes to the left-hand side, which part goes to the right-hand side of the bar. Okay? So here comes the calculation. A typical trick is, um, since probability is about multiplying stuff, we take the logarithm. Okay? So taking the logarithm here, we get this curly L, little letter L, which stands for the log likelihood very often. And it's just the logarithm of the likelihood. It's the log likelihood. If you do this, um, the likelihood was a product, and if you apply the logarithm, you get a sum of logarithms. If you plug in the Gaussian distribution, yeah, you get exactly here this mean squared error of, of things, right? Because that is the exponent of the Gaussian distribution. And logarithm, natural logarithm, just gets you back the exponent of the e to the something. And you get a minus sign over here. Then what about that one? That is just a constant term in front of the Gaussian distribution. Also, the logarithm will kind of uh, make a summation of the normalizing factor that gets one summoned and basically e to the something, the logarithm of that one, gets the other summoned. Okay? That's where you get this one. So the mean squared error is also called sum of squared error or L2 norm of residual error and so on and so forth. As often with super successful methods, they have been invented over and over again. And this is not like, um, this is not 
like bad or something. It just shows that it's a really good idea that originates in many different fields. Sometimes people are unaware that it already exists in other fields and they invent a new name for it. And this is totally fine, okay? Just, it's good if some person, for example, Wikipedia at the end, kind of brings it all together and says, by the way, those are all the same methods. So, we see now maximum likelihood estimation, so finding a maximum likelihood estimator, having assumed a Gaussian likelihood leads to the method of least squares, okay? That is a really nice, interesting result because it kind of gives us a better foundation whether to think about the question whether it makes sense to use least squares or better to use like an L1 norm. Um, what else can we say? Um, if we have Gaussian distributed measurements, so if the error on our measurement is Gaussian distributed, then least square is a well justified method. There's more to say about it. Um, Gaussian distribution is also a maximum entropy distribution, okay? And in a way, another point of view here is to say, uh, I'm ignorant about the stuff that I don't know, so I take the solution that has the maximum entropy, and that is the Gaussian distribution. That's why I'm using a Gaussian distribution. But related, it's uh, the central limit theorem tells me anyway I should use the Gaussian distribution because I'm assuming all these measure, uh, measurement errors from my telescope, from the screws of my telescope, from my stupid assistants dealing with the telescope, and so on and so forth. If I sum them all up, it's like a, a big sum of random variables, and that converges against the Gaussian distribution. So it's a good choice to do this. Good, so in his paper from 1809, um, he used the mean, and the mean is the solution to the least square problem, but why are we taking the least square thing? And he showed that by having a particular distribution, the Gaussian distribution, a normal distribution, everything is fine, and you can theoretically derive the method very rigorously, okay? Why is it interesting? Because suddenly kind of you get a better feeling what these parameters are in this method and what kind of, there are some little tricks that you can do once you understand it. You can think about correlated errors and stuff like that. And suddenly maybe you get an even better measurement of CRS. And I think it, at the end, Gauss in, inferred from three data points the location we had to look at behind the sun when the CRS passing the sun, and he was right. So he was finding the planet with his least square method here, okay? Which was a big deal at the time. I think um, there are now also modern papers on it if you want to learn about it. It's really interesting stuff. So there are modern um, papers that kind of celebrate the whole derivation, explain everything in detail with our words today. Good, so this is maximum likelihood estimation. So if I assume a certain likelihood for my measurements, then there will be a close, uh, then there will be a solution to it, which is the minimum of my log likelihood. So if you look at that one, it has a vector value w in here, and you can calculate the derivative with respect to the w and derive a solution. And it's derived um, with, for example, matrix differential calculus, which we see next week maybe. So that's a, a fun topic, which gives you superpowers in calculating derivatives. Um, and if you do it, you get this nice formula now, which might have been familiar to you already. So this is also called ordinary least squares. And let's look at it. All the measurements y are stacked in a long vector. All my locations are rows in matrix X. And if I do it that way, then basically this computation is calculating me the optimal W as a closed form solution. So now what was this with these transpose signs? So if I would have written it with X transpose W, we would have had here x times x transpose inverse, and here we have x times y. But that's not the formula that people memorize. People memorize this formula. That's the common one. And this one you only get when you put your locations as rows in your matrix x. If you do it the other way around, you would have to transpose all the x's in here. And the result is the same. Okay? Good. So far, so good. So here's a quick demo. I show you also a demo maybe in a Jupyter notebook just in a second. So suppose this is your data, and now I say I want to fit it with a polynomial that has two parameters, w0 and w1. So with other words, my polynomial is a linear function. Yeah, then I get this nice solution over here. And how do I get it? I just apply this formula here. I'm just calculating this formula, and I get my w. I could also, fill, um, I could also fit a parabola here with three parameters, 
and then I get this nice match to my data. However, I could also um, fit a more complicated function with 10 coefficients, yeah, that, or 11 coefficients in this case, and I get a nice fit like that, which might be even better. And of course, there's an interesting question, now what is the right answer, right? And by looking at the data visually, you probably can see that this is kind of an underfit, so it's not explaining that in this region here, everything is below the line, and in that reason, a region and that region at the beginning, everything is above the line. Okay, that's kind of weird. Um, what about that one? That looks like a decent fit. It looks like the data is like equally distributed, sometimes on top and sometimes at the bottom. And this looks like it's really fitting the noise in the data. Okay, it's really nicely going through all the details, but it's overdoing it a bit. There are also ways to automatically now determine the D, which um, there will be a lecture on it. I don't know when, okay? But this is hyperparameter search or model selection, okay? Where we kind of need to decide what to do. As a preview, what you could do is you could split your data in training and testing. You fit on the training data and then you evaluate your learned function on the test data. And then you will see that the fit here will be worse than the fit that you got here, okay? And then that's a simple way to find out. Uh, let me show you some code. Okay, that one switched. So I had made some implementation of this one. Um, first of all, I, I need to implement this function phi. And here I'm assuming the x is a vector, where vector now is not a single location, but this is a vector of location. So my locations are all scalars. I want to do a 2D plot anyway, so my x is just one dimensional, and if I have several of those x's, I can put them into a vector. And now if I put it into a vector and do the right reshape, I can calculate for all of the scalars simultaneously all these power to the zero, power to the one, and so on and so forth. So basically this is, uh, I think, a row vector, a column vector, and this is the other one. And if I connect them with the to the power of, I'm getting a matrix of entries. So this thing is really calculating the phi of capital X. Okay, that's what's calculating here. So as a test, um, you see here the first one is one. That's just because the first column is determined by to the power of zero. Okay, and so on and so forth. Okay, then I have a function f which takes an x and a w, and I implemented it quite flexible. So the w can have any length. And then depending on the length, I'm choosing the D. And then depending on the D, I'm doing my nonlinear transformation. Okay, so that's like a clever way of implementing it. And I can calculate it, and if I have five random ver values, I get a, a, a results vector of possible Y's, also five possible scalar value of Y, where I would have to add noise as well. So the adding noise comes here. So suppose I want to sample. I could do it like this. I give it a, a W true. I give it a number of data points I want and some standard deviation for the noise. I just randomly sample some locations, uniformly distributed. That's not the main point of the whole thing here. And then I am evaluating my function with my true parameter that is given plus some random noise, some measurement noise, okay? So far so good. Can do this too. Now comes the magic function here. So now this is linear regression. So it's getting the locations x, it's getting the outputs y, and some parameter d, which is telling me whether I'm fitting a linear function or a polynomial or something more complicated. So I'm mapping my x into a high dimensional space, and I'm not calling it phi x, I'm just calling it x. It's a ma matrix x where every row is a new location. And then I can just apply the formula from the slide. So this is just x transpose matrix multiplication with x and the inverse of it, matrix multiplication with x transpose, matrix multiplication with the vector y. Okay, so this is just the formula for the least squares one, just copied literally to NumPy. Um, the inverse of something can be also written with some LST SQ. And I'm sure you know what it means. It means least squares, right? So it has something to do with least squares. So it's finding the least square solution for something. But I'm just using it to calculate the inverse or to avoid calculating the inverse. So there's some numerical tricks here. Good, so this is calcul calculating this vector w. Now here comes the toy example. So I'm generating data. 
and I'm just showing you the result and how it's generated, you can figure out yourself. So I'm having my data, which are these points here, and then for different um, values of d, I fitted a polynomial. So I fitted a straight line that was d equals 2. I fitted like a squared function, which is d equals 3, and one with 10 coefficient, which is having this overfitting effect. Okay? And so here you can play around with, I don't know, you could also say here's a d candidates, whatever, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, whatever. You can, you can do them all at the same time, and you can look at them and see how they overfit and play around with it. Okay? So far, so good. That's the slide, but the code for it. Um, there are sometimes problems with, with these uh, maximum likelihood estimates. If you have too many parameters, if your polynomial is very long, and you have only a few data points, yeah, you might overfit the parameters if you have too little data. Sometimes then the weights can get really large. That's an observation, a practical observation that you have. Why do they get large? Because we are multiplying with the inverse of this data matrix. And if x transposed x, that's the matrix, uh, symmetric matrix, if there are very small eigenvalues in there, the inverse will have very large eigenvalues, which results in very large weights w, which are exactly the fit, but which are very wrong, possibly. Okay? So we might want to encourage a smoother solution by putting a zero mean Gaussian prior on our w. This is like saying, I prefer weight vectors which are small. Now, being Bayesian, we would say, I prefer weight vectors which are sampled from a Gaussian distribution. Okay? So we have a prior about it. Good. And then we do map estimation. So if you go through the, through the mass, you are now maximizing the posterior distribution here, yeah, where we have the likelihood, the prior, uh, yeah, no, yeah, the prior and also the evidence, it's all conditioned on x because the x is a constant here. Yeah? We are only, the, the variable stuff is the y, which has some noisy stuff on it. And then if you go through the derivation, you get also the least square term, but you get additionally this regularization term, as I showed you already before on some other slides. Okay? So basically, this originates from an assumption that the w should be small. Yeah? And it also has some nice interpretation. So and if you solve z1 for w, you get this expression over here, which is also called rich regression. Okay? That's a common method in statistics too. When you look at it, what's happening here, basically you have this matrix x transpose x, which might be not so well behaved, which might have very small eigenvalues. And then the inversion will lead to an explosion of your matrix, and you get very large matrix, and you multiply it, and it, everything gets very large. By adding lambdas onto the diagonal on the, of this matrix, kind of you are increasing the smallest eigenvalues. So the smallest eigenvalues of the resulting matrix will be at least lambda. And that means if you take the inverse matrix of it, again, you are more well behaved and you will avoid this exploding W. Okay? So that's the numerical description. You are regularizing, you're making this inversion numerically more stable. Okay? The Bayesian explanation for this is what you're doing is you're assuming a prior distribution on your weight parameter. You're saying it should come from a Gaussian distribution. And then you get exactly the rich regression if you do map estimation. Good. So um, rich regression has other names. It's also called penalized least squares. It's another name for it. Okay. And this um, Lambda times the norm of W is also called L2 regularization. It's also called weight decay. So there are different names for the same thing. Okay? Good. Um, we can also do Z1. Can I show you? No, I don't show you yet. Um, basically, just changing this function linear regression, you also have to add some identity matrix before doing the inversion, basically. Okay? That's it. Good. Um, now, how do we regularize exactly? So why do we choose this lambda here? Could we also do something else? We could also change this hyperparameter d of the dimensionality, right? So in principle, you can do both. The d is changing the model complexity. So how complicated can your model be? Just a linear function, just a squared function, or maybe a polynomial of degree up to 10? So that's that one. And the lambda, as we've seen last time already, is basically related to the measurement noise. 
and the strength of your prior. Okay? So one is trying to get rid of the noise in the measurement, that's a regularization parameter, so more trust your prior a bit more if your measurements are very noisy, and the D is basically a hyperparameter which is increasing the model complexity. However, they are related with each other. If I increase the model complexity and make it very large, yeah, then also my estimate can go really wild. Because this matrix here, what is it? I mean, it is the outer product of these things, but you can also interpret it, right? So basically, um, suppose your original data is coming from a two-dimensional plane with x1 and x2, and then you map it into a very high-dimensional space, then this thing kind of still is suffering from the low dimensionness of your data, and that's why the inversion is breaking down possibly, okay? So it's all interpretable here. Okay, what else do we have? So I told you all this one. Yeah, as I said, the, the D is more about model complexity, the lambda is more about the noise in your data, okay? And you need to trade off about it. So far, so good. So that is rich regression. Rich regression was a map estimate. Being really Bayesian about it, we don't want to have like a point estimate of our W, but we want to maybe derive a posterior predictive distribution or something. So we want to use the distribution of the W and then go on with our inference to infer the stuff that we are really interested in, for example, doing prediction. So in classical ways, you would estimate a W, and then you would say, OK, I predict the CO2 to be in five years W times blah, blah, blah. If you're doing it in a Bayesian way, you have to invest the prior, which are classical statisticians with regularization also doing. Yeah? But then you're also making use of the variance in your estimate, and you are integrating out the W. I will show you. So we can derive, first of all, the posterior distribution of the W. So let me show you how to do it. So our prior is the Gaussian distribution. Our likelihood is the Gaussian distribution. So they are conjugate to each other. So we can derive a posterior distribution, which is Gaussian too. And now these expressions are just permutations of the letters that we've seen before. But those are exactly the same formulas in the, as in the lecture of Gaussian distribution, OK? So in principle, we are not only able to calculate a posterior mean or a map estimate or a median or something, but we also get a posterior covariance, which has a lot of information in it, OK? Now, what can we do with the posterior? Um, we can use it. Um, ah, OK, now first, let me first explain again the posterior mean, OK? So the posterior mean corresponds to rich regression, OK? So one can show that this expression over here is if you plug in all these simplifying assumptions, so not having a complicated sigma but having a diagonal matrix, and not having a complicated V0 as your starting covariance matrix for the W, but having a very simple one, this tau squared, if you plug all of those into this formula, into this formula over here, you just get the solution of the rich regression. So with other words, the solution of the rich regression the map estimate of blah, 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 can be also seen as the mean of the posterior distribution. That's a bit surprising. Wasn't the mean like um, much better than using the map estimate? Ah, sometimes. I mean, the Gaussian distribution is a symmetric distribution. And for a symmetric distribution, the maximum is the mean. That's why, in this case, it's the same thing, whether you are doing map or whether you are calculating the mean. Okay. Good, so you can go through it, just plug this stuff in here, and you will end up with a rich regression. Again, a nice interpretation. Yeah, so you could also say now, OK, if your loss function is blah, 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 you should take the mean of the posterior. And that's, that's what you're actually doing when you are using penalized least squares. OK, that's a very interesting interpretation of the whole thing. Good, what do we gain from having the posterior? We also have the covariance matrix for my estimate. And this is a, a very interesting feature that we only get if we do it in this Bayesian fashion and really looking at the full posterior. So um, yeah, let, this is an example. But I first want to show you the posterior predictive distribution. So now plugging in my posterior distribution of my W and plugging it into this expression 
I can integrate out my parameters, and this is also using the variances to get like a prediction of a new data point. So this could be like the extrapolation, what is the CO2 in five years? And this would not only use a point estimate, but it would use the full posterior distribution. So it would also use the variance. In particular, I will get a variance at the end. So it also gives me error bars for my estimate. Mm -hmm. Of course, classical statisticians can also do all of this, okay? but they sometimes have different names for the same thing. Good, so this is very nice. So this is Bayesian linear regression. Instead of having a point estimate for the W, you take a posterior, and then basically you are um, deriving a distribution for an extrapolated value, which also gives you a point estimate, but also error bars, okay? Yeah, note that the location is, uh, that the variance is location dependent. Why am I pointing that one out? So the X is my new thing, so that's the, I want, I'm interested in the CO2 emissions in year 2050 or something, okay? So this is the 2050, and the Y is the CO2 emissions. So the variance depends on where I'm evaluating my function, okay? And that is expressed by this expression at the back. So what does it mean? If I'm extrapolating very far away, being very far away from my data, the variance will be very large. If I'm there where my data is, the variance will be very small. Okay, that's an additional nice feature here. Good, and we can also derive it for these special cases and getting simpler formulas, okay, which you might have seen elsewhere. Good, um, before I'm showing you the last demo, um, we've seen linear regression, which was assuming, like for the measurement, Gaussian errors. However, I could also assume other errors. I could assume like L1 style errors. I could assume a Laplace distribution for my measurements for whatever reason. Maybe I know my measurement device, when I look into the specifications, I see don't use a Gaussian measurement error, use a Laplacian measurement error. That's just how the device is um, set up. And in this case, um, we would have the L1 norm here. And actually, there are many different options. So you could combine the Gaussian likelihood with different priors on your W. And you can also use different likelihoods and combine them, for example, with uniform priors. And these methods, then typically, they got their own names. You might have heard about lasso, which is trying to find a sparse W. So it's trying to find a, a weight vector where most entries are 0, and only some of them are non-zero. And this could be understood like combining a Gaussian likelihood with a Laplacian prior. And then there's also some forms of robust regression. Robust usually refers to outliers in your data, so some Y measurements might be totally off, and that could screw your least square estimate. And then there are some robust estimators which use some other distributions for the noise measurement. Okay, so there are many different options here. Good, so that is the overview of linear regression. So linear regression is linear in the parameter, and it's, I think, best understood if you specify a prior for your parameter and the likelihood for your measurements, and then you just apply the formulas from the previous slides. That's it. And then you get the different formulas that you might be familiar with also from the statistics lecture. Good, let's again finally look at the demo. So oh, here's some fun data. This is just about linear regression. Why it's sometimes interesting. So those are four different data sets. They are very different. But when you do linear regression and you print the estimated parameters, you will get exactly the same parameters. So those are four different data sets which have exactly the same solution when you do a linear linear regression through it. Okay. And here I'm showing you the data. However, the data is very different. So this is the first data set. And if you fit a line, you get that one. This is the second data set. And it's tuned in such a way that you get exactly the same solution as in the first example. Here's another one. You also get exactly the same solution. And this is yet another one with an outlier, okay, where you see a line, but you don't get that one. You get the other one. And this is called um, Ernst Combi's Quartet. So it's typically, it's a design, those are four design data sets which should show you that just by blindly applying linear regression, for example, to your data um, might not be such a clever idea. So you should always also try to look at the scatter plots. Because here you would say, you know, probably a better fit would be a parabola. 
Okay, and then there's finally the Bayesian linear regression, and I did some implementation here with some plots uh, that you can have a look at, but I show you the result on the slides. So it's the one that I omitted over here. So basically, this slide is showing you a cartoon of Bayesian linear regression. So you have a prior of the W, and you can plot it. So this is the first axis is W0, W1, and you are centered around the zero. And then when you see a single data point, then this posterior distribution is shaping itself and kind of converging to a certain location over here, which is then basically the posterior distribution after seeing several data points. Okay? Um, on this side, it shows you samples. If you sample a random function from this Gaussian distribution, the function on xy space were those straight lines. If you now have the single data point here, now they are all going approximately through the data point. If you have two data points like that, then most estimates from this distribution now, they will go really nicely through the data, and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is like a way to visualize the Bayesian linear regression. I copied it from Murphy's book, so this is figure 711. So in particular, if you want to have a more extended explanation and want to understand what you really see here, how to reduce these plots, I, I refer you to the Murphy's book on this one. Okay, so thanks a lot for your extension, uh, extended uh, attention, and we are at the end of section 8, and next time I think we talk about matrix differential calculus to, for example, derive this maximum likelihood estimate yeah, as a closed form solution without using any sub-indices. Okay, so that's the goal. Thanks a lot. I see you next Monday.